from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Ray Milland and Phyllis Baxter in Close to My Heart. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Our play tonight, produced by the Warner Brothers Studios and directed by William Keeley, is outstanding in its appeal to those who wish to become parents by adoption. It's close to my heart, the moving story of a man who felt he must know the background of his adopted baby. And as our stars tonight, we have one of our best actors, Ray Milland, co-starring with that delightful actress, Phyllis Thaxter. Now, Close to My Heart, starring Ray Milland as Brad and Phyllis Thaxter as Midge. It's early evening, and Brad Sheridan has just come home from the office. Nothing at all unusual about that, but Brad's brought home a friend. A newly acquired young friend. Brad, what on earth? Oh, no, not a puppy. Well, how do you like it? Light color and everything, huh? You bought this dog? Oh, darling, whatever possessed you? Well, it's been so peaceful around here. Every home should have a dog. Says so in all the books. Come here, Hector. Hector? That's a wonderful name. You know, since Hector was a pup. <laughs> anyway, I saw him in the pet shop and I... Oh, what's the matter, honey? Don't you want him? Oh, uh, of course I want him. He's adorable. You're not worried about the rugs or anything? Oh, no, nothing like that. It's just... Brad, how did you happen to think of getting him? Well, I don't know. How does anybody happen to think about getting a dog? <laughs> you didn't feel that we... Oh, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. What's true? That a lot of people who don't have children, well, they get dogs. You're right. It does sound ridiculous. So that's why I bought Hector, huh? Just because there's an empty room upstairs we've never used for a nursery. Well? That's one way of saying it, yes. I can't help it, Brad. I, I feel like such a washout. Honey, are you foolish enough to be ashamed of not having a baby? I'm not foolish, and I am ashamed. Of course I am. How could a wife feel worse? Oh, Brad, darling, don't you want a baby? Sure, I want a baby if you do. Maybe even two babies. <laughs> Well, we'll never have any, Brad. Who says we won't? A pretty big doctor named Williamson. I I saw him this afternoon. Are you going to take the word of just one doctor? No, but after you find they all tell you the same thing, you begin to believe it. Well, honey, life is more than just babies, you know. It can be footloose, fancy free. Why, I might even wangle a foreign assignment or a... Or... Well... Can't we get one through the mail or something, or adopt one, or... Brad, do you really want to adopt one? Why, sure. What's wrong with that? Now, look, you go downtown the first thing in the morning and bring back something and cry. Oh, be serious. I, I couldn't stand it if I thought you were just teasing. But I am serious. But just one thing. Yes? It's got to be a girl, so she'll grow up to be just like you, beautiful and sweet and... Oh, poor Hector. I guess he just doesn't want any competition around here. <laughs> no sense yelling about it, Pop. You're in for plenty. And I think we're finally making progress, Brad. I, I called her Mrs. Morrow again at the Children's Home Foundation, and this time she gave me... Well, here, look. Application papers for adoption. Well, imagine that. After three weeks, she finally gives us some forms to fill out. But <laughs> you don't understand what... They've got a waiting list of over a hundred... That's just what I do mean, Midge. It's so hopeless. She told you we'd have to wait two years, maybe. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. Oh? What did you do? Impress her with the fact that I'm the big columnist in the Evening Post? Well, don't think that doesn't help. No, it's something else, Brad. I... Well, I think I know where there is a baby. Everybody knows we're looking for one, and, well, Yvonne called me just before you came home. Who on earth is Yvonne? My hairdresser. She knows about a baby. So what? I knew about him when I was 12. Oh, Brad, please. 
This one was left at the police station, the Brewster Street police station, about two weeks ago. Police station? What is this, baby, a three-time loser? Will you please listen? Look, darling, I know how anxious you are, but don't you think we'd better stick with the regular adoption people? Oh, but we will. If this baby's available, we'll have the foundation handle everything. It's just that, well, if we find it first, we should have first chance at it, shouldn't we? Well, I guess so, but... Okay, go see him about it. I know you will anyway. Oh, you mind if I, I drive over there right now? Go ahead. I'll see what I can do with this application. And I won't do anything foolish, Brad. I, I promise I won't. <laughs> oh, and the puppy, don't forget to feed him. And take him out right after you do. Yes, dear. <laughs> They wouldn't tell me very much at the police station, Mr. Duncan. They said I had to see you first, so, well, here I am. And you see, I'm a probation officer, Miss Sheridan. Well, it is true there was a child left at the police station. It was taken to the hospital and then to the juvenile court. Juvenile court? A tiny baby? Just procedure before the court turned it over to me. But well, where's the baby now? He's in a boarding home. Then it's a boy. Oh, it's nice to know even that much. Makes me feel I'm getting much closer. You're not close at all, Mrs. Sheridan. Our first job is to find the real mother. Then I... I couldn't even see him. I'm sorry, no. Oh. Well, if the mother doesn't claim him, you will let us know. That depends. You see, Jimmy is still a ward of the court. Jimmy? Oh, he even has a name. Well, we had to call him something, and I never did like John Doe. You check with me in about a week. How's that? Not for another week. It may take much longer than that, finding the mother. Uh, I'll call in a week, then. Thank you. Midge? Hiya, honey. Oh, Brad, I, I know you're terribly busy, darling, but I, I just saw that Mr. Duncan again. Duncan? The probation officer, the one I saw last week. Oh? He said he had nothing more he could tell me. Well, it's probably better this way. There's no telling what we'd be getting into. Oh, but darling, I just got a wonderful idea. Now that we know the baby's at the boarding home and we know his name is Jimmy... Oh, Brad, I've simply got to see him. But what can I do, Midge, if the probation officer refused but to even... But you know everybody at the city hall and you can find out anything. If you just tell them... Look, tell them it's an item or something for your collar. Midge... What if you do see him? You still can't get him. Please, darling, let's stay out of this. Brad, you won't even try. Oh. Okay. Okay, I'll try. It's the right address. Brad, please ring the bell again. I just did. Well, oh, maybe they didn't hear it. They heard it. Now, look, Midge, you're all keyed up. Please take it easy. Coming here to a boarding home isn't... It, it, well, it doesn't mean a thing. Ring the bell again. Do you suppose it's really possible to become a father just by ringing a bell? <laughs> oh, you must be the columnist. And you're Mrs. Barker? Yes. Well, uh, this is Miss Clapsaddle, my, uh, my secretary. <laughs> well, come right in. I've never seen a columnist before. Oh, don't say that word out loud. You might scare the baby. This way, please. I thought we wanted a girl. Oh, darling, you don't really care, do you? No, but when you see him, please, just remember, there are millions of other babies, will you? Well, here he is. Isn't this a darling? Hey, mm. looks like a wrestler. <laughs> oh, do you mind if I hold him? Just for a minute. No, of course not. <laughs> You've uh, taken care of a lot of babies for the county, Mrs. Barker. Oh, yes, but Jimmy's my favorite. I guess the one I have at the moment always is my favorite. Look at him. Why, usually he cries with strangers. Remember now, Midge. Millions. Mm, not like this one. Oh, how precious. Oh, what do you know about him, Mrs. Barker? The county pays for his keep. That's all I know. <laughs> all anyone will ever know, I guess. Oh, just look at him, Brad. Just look at him. <laughs> Listening, Midge. Honest, I am. How can you listen and play with a dog at the same time? Oh, easy there. You called Mrs. Morrow with the Children's Home Foundation. Yes, and she says the authorities wouldn't let any adoption agency have Jimmy for months yet. Oh, it's all so legal. Anyway, they still haven't found the baby. Well, Midge, suppose they. 
Ouch! Cut that out! He's got teeth like a tiger. Now, suppose they do give it to Mrs. Morrow's home. Then what? Well, we're right back where we were. Everybody on their waiting list is ahead of us. It's just like we... Ha- Brad, aren't you at all interested in what I've been saying? Yes, darling, I am interested. But can't you see what our chances are? And besides... Well, besides what? Well, you know how I feel. How anybody'd feel. If we had a child of our own, we could be pretty sure of the way he'd turn out. And the same goes for one Mrs. Morrow could vouch for. But with Jimmy, well, who knows? Gee, honey, this is for life. Brad. Oh, come on, cheer up. Two years isn't forever. I'm going over there again tomorrow to Mrs. Barker's. But you know how I feel about this. Yes, I suppose I do. But I'm going anyway. I've got to. You're just torturing yourself, Midge. Seeing the child and knowing all along, you'll never get him. Don't you want him? That's beside the point, Midge. Be sensible. I want Jimmy Brad. I can't be sensible. I just can't. All right. Go ahead. Go and see him tomorrow if you want him. Up on my desk just before I came home, Blanchard, and uh, he said it was okay if I took my vacation in July. Hmm? Oh, 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 yes, dear. That book must be very interesting. Hmm, it is. You know, he really should have a sister. Who should have what sister? Why, Jimmy, of course. I mean, whoever we get. The book says they get all sorts of complexes and neuroses, and a boy and a girl would be just perfect, wouldn't they? You said you always wanted a girl anyway. Midge. He could look out for at school, and, oh, he's such a sturdy little baby already. Midge, did you see Jimmy again today? Yes. Doesn't anything I say mean anything to you? But you said I could see him. That was over a week ago. Oh, Brad, the the way he's growing, and he knows me now, he really knows me, I'm sure he does. How often have you been going over there? How often? Why? Because I've got an idea, it's been about every day. And all the while you know there isn't a chance in a million we'll ever get him, even if we wanted him. If we wanted him. Oh, Brad, how can you say that? You haven't even seen him, not since that first time. Can't you understand I don't want to see him? I don't want to get all wrapped up in him. You haven't looked at tonight's paper, have you? Just the headline. Not my column? Well, no, you know I always save your column. Look at it now, Midge. It's about Jimmy, the lead paragraph. Jimmy? I had to do something, so I... I've asked that if anyone thinks he knows who Jimmy's mother really is to get in touch with the police. Oh, no, how could you? Because we've got to bring things to a head. So we'll know just where we stand and who Jimmy is. That's all you care about, Brad. Who he is, not what he is. Can't you see how you're counting on him? Midge, you've got no right to do that. I'm not counting on him. I I simply want to see justice done. Justice? Yes, justice. It isn't fair to send him back to a mother who... Oh. Oh, Midge, please, we don't even know who the mother is. We don't know anything. Can I come in? Who is it? Mrs. Morrow, the Children's Home Foundation. Mrs. Morrow. Oh, please come in. Thank you. That's quite a watchdog on the porch. He's sound asleep. Oh, please don't look so surprised. Well, I can't say that we expected you, Mrs. Morrow. Oh, and just look at me. And this house. Well, it's just part of what you must put up with if you want one of our babies. A home visit, we call it. Don't let it frighten you. Oh, no, no, not at all. I, I'm just scared to death. Well, won't you sit down, Mrs. Morrow? <laughs> I'll just be a minute. My, what a, a lovely bar. <coughs> the bar. It, it, it came with a house. We hardly ever use it, honestly. What a pity. I was thinking you might offer me a drink. Oh, oh, well, well what you like? A scotch, bourbon, a little gin? <laughs> Nothing, or... thank you. Oh. I just wanted you to know that you could offer me one and I wouldn't drop dead. <laughs> I saw your column, Mr. Sheridan. It's good of you to cooperate with the authorities, if that was your purpose. Well, I, I, I thought you that... see, if you should take a founding like Jimmy, you'd never know anything about him or about his parents. You'd be getting a completely unknown quantity. You mean we can have him? I only mean that the courts decided to make Jimmy available for adoption... And the foundation is to place him. But there's still a waiting list, isn't there? Oh, yes. But I won't let anyone have Jimmy unless I'm sure they won't worry about his unknown background. So if you want him desperately enough, 
There may be just a chance. Oh, but we do. We do. You do, Mrs. Sheridan. But does Mr. Sheridan? Why, of course. If Midge wants him, then... Yes, I think I know just how you feel. You want Jimmy or any baby simply because your wife does. But I'm not really worried about you. Neither am I. But please, never forget for one moment that there are many people ahead of you. It all depends on them and on Jimmy's mental and physical development. Unless he's perfect in every way, no one will get him. Oh, but he is. Let's hope the doctors say so, too. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got a lot more calls to make. Is she gone? Yes. Oh, oh, I'm such an awful fool, Brad. Why don't you say so? All right. You're an awful fool. But I love you. In spite of? Because of. Brad, I'm scared. For the first time, I'm scared. The thing she said, I, I mean mental and physical development. She wouldn't have said that unless she thinks that Jimmy is... Well, it's just routine. They've, they've got to check. Gee, I'm scared, too. Brad. All of a sudden, I've got a feeling I'm going to be a father. We'll continue with this week's production of the Hollywood Radio Theater in just a moment. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. In Paris, there's a statue of such an American, Myron T. Herrick, who was our ambassador to France in 1914. By June of that year, Mr. Herrick was preparing to return home after a most satisfactory tour of duty when the war began. The German ambassador asked Mr. Herrick to take over German interests in France. And Mr. Herrick not only agreed, but personally advanced the German ambassador $5,000 to move his staff out of France. Well, that was only the beginning. In addition to helping Americans who wished to return home, he handled the affairs of the Austrian government in France, also the Turkish, Serbian, Japanese, and later those of Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Liberia. He helped set up a large hospital in New York, and from his fellow Americans abroad, raised $500,000 to keep it going. At the end of two years, when he finally left for America, many letters of thanks went with him. One from the grateful French people said in part, Are you aware of what you have done for the sake of civilization and for France? We had hoped that you would have been kept here forever as the good genius, the good friend, and the extraordinary ambassador. So it was that by going beyond the limits of his duty, Myron Herrick discovered that by helping others, you help your country. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of Close to My Heart, starring Ray Milland as Brad and Phyllis Thaxter as Midge, with Jeanette Nolan as Mrs. Morrow. A few weeks have gone by. At his office at the newspaper, Brad's had an urgent call from Midge to meet her right away at the Children's Home Foundation, where Brad's arriving now by taxi cab. Hey, you want me to wait for you, Mac? No, no thanks. Hey, uh, say, aren't you the guy that writes that column, Brad Sheridan? Well, should I admit it? Well, you've been writing some things lately about kids, following kids. Well, I've been writing a lot about a lot of things, but I'm sorry, I'm in a hurry. Uh, look, look, uh, suppose a guy tells you something. Do you keep it quiet? You mean, do I protect my sources of information? Why, absolutely. I think I got something for well, you. Well, swell, swell. See me tomorrow, huh, at the newspaper. Okay, Mr. Sheridan. Well, thanks a lot. Oh, Brad. Oh, thank goodness you could get here. What's going on? All you said on the phone was... It's Jimmy. Everybody's turned him down because he was a foundling. Isn't it wonderful? He seems rather pleased about it himself, Mr. Sheridan. This is Jimmy? Well, of course. <laughs> Boy, he certainly has grown. Didn't I tell you? And he's passed all the tests, mental and physical. With flying colors. Oh, Jimmy, I'm so proud of you. Mrs. Morrow, you, uh... You mean he's ours now? We can take him? Not quite. But you get him ready, Mrs. Sheridan. All his things are here while your husband steps across the hall with me. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. And no arguments, Brad. Just do what Mrs. Morrow tells you. Uh -huh. Well, Mr. Sheridan, I wanted to get you alone because I want to give you one more chance to back out of this. Why do you say that? Because I know a worried husband when I see one. I didn't know it showed. 
You must have read that case in the newspapers. The Kincaid boy? Yes, I've read all about it. He held up a store. Robert Kincaid's been pilfering and stealing for years. His father's always managed to cover up for him until now. The point is, Robert is an adopted boy. He huh. was a foundling like Jimmy. So uh, that's why he became available to us so quickly. The people ahead of you, well, they didn't want to take the chance. The case didn't frighten you. Should it? Logically, of course not. Well, I'm scared of my wife, Mrs. Morrow, of her being so sure. Somewhere in the world, a woman was waiting for Jimmy. Your wife is that woman. I'm counting on her and Jimmy to make a proud father out of you. In any event, the adoption won't be final until you've had a chance to make up your mind. That's all, Mr. Sheridan. Brad, what time is it? Can you see the clock? Yeah. Ten minutes after four. In the morning. But, but a baby doesn't cry unless he's... Brad, he stopped. Something must be wrong. Wrong? At last something's right. Ten minutes past four. I bet I haven't slept more than... Uh, maybe it's somebody else's baby next door. There isn't any baby next door. Think they could use one? Oh. He, he must be hungry, but we can't feed him again. The pediatrician would shoot us. All right, you stay here. I'll attend to him. Anyway, I can't kick. At least I've had four happy years. Now, okay, okay. Now, let's cut out the noise. You can't be hungry and you can't be lonesome. Of course, it's possible that you're... No? Fries a bone. Look, you're supposed to be a happy baby. The book says so. Okay, have it your own way. Brad, where are you going? Where do you think? To the phone. I'm going to call Mrs. Barker. You do, and I'll never speak to you again. It's all right, Jimmy. I'm coming, darling. I'm coming. Maybe if I pick you up. Maybe if I... Brad. Brad. How come he stopped? I, I don't know. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy. Look at him, Brad. Look. All you did was pick him up. Oh, no. No, it's more than that. Don't you realize what's happened? It's the most wonderful feeling in the world. The strangeness is over. He's ours now. You remember me, Mr. Sheridan, the cab driver? You told me to come by and see you. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, it's about that kid about, you know, that you wrote in your column about the real mother. Well, that was some time ago. Well, I was scared to go to the cops, but then when I saw you, well, I kind of What about the real mother? I can drive you to where she lives, a walk up on the south side. How do you know she's still there? I don't. Not for sure. Okay, come on. I think we better find out. Well, it's late at night, see, and this dame is standing on the corner. She sees me cruising, and I pick her up. She had this box. Box? Well, at first, I didn't even know it was a kid. Then I hit this fork, and I almost hit the car ahead. Anyway, I drop her Brewster in 41st. Ten minutes later, I'm still looking for a fare, and she hails me again. Only this time, she ain't got the box. How would you remember her apartment number? I didn't. But when I see you a piece in the paper, I hung around the building till I see her go in. Oh, I couldn't forget her, Mr. Sheridan. She's a real Lulu, a blonde. Well, this is it. Top floor. Apartment 36. Wait for me. Get away from the door, mister. I told you, this is my sleeping time. I'm sorry, but I gotta talk to you. It's about your baby. Oh, listen, you. Nobody's gonna hang a rap on me for ditching that kid. Nobody's trying to hang anything on you. Can I come in? Come in. Look, that kid wasn't mine. I'm telling you the truth. And if you cops are smart... I'm you'll... not a cop. The police know nothing about this. Not a cop? Who are you, then? My wife and I adopted that baby. Adopted it? And it's only natural we'd like to know something about his parents. His mother. Well, she had the next room down the hall. Only she's not there now. She's dead. She died three days after the baby was born. Who was she? Her name was Martha. I never knew her real last name. Nobody did. She 
came here about a month before the baby was born. All alone in there, even when the baby came. Alone? She wanted to die, I guess. Well, she asked me to take the baby away. She didn't want him found with her. To ever know who his mother was. I was plenty scared, but she'd been sweet to me, so I did it. What did she look like? Kind of pretty for being so sick. She talked nice when she talked. She never smiled, not once. She gave me a wedding ring. She didn't want the coroner to find out anything. May I see it? The ring? I guess you got a right to. But I hope you can't make nothing out of it. She wouldn't want you to. When I came back that night, she was dead. She looked kind of young then. Real young. But the coroner, he must have known there'd been a baby. Oh, I told him her husband was here, and he took the baby with him. That he was taking the kid to Nebraska. Oh, I did it up real good. Well, does ring mean anything to you? His initials. M-L-E-C-H. Martha L. and E-C-H. What about the cops, mister? This will be just between you and me. But only as long as you're telling the truth. Okay. Now go on. Get out. Look at him, Brad. He finished the entire bottle. And dead to the world. <laughs> well, take him. Burp him before he's sound asleep. Well, he's your son, too. Burp him? What do I do? Like this? Harder. He won't break. Well, he did it. Well, Jimmy, you've done your duty and I've done mine. <laughs> I'll take him, dear. What's your hurry? Can't I even... I'll get it. Hello? Oh, oh yes, Mr. Forrest. Well, he's holding the baby at the moment. Oh, the most wonderful baby in the world. Yes, go right ahead. Uh, I have a pencil. Yes. Martha L. E. C. H. The last five years. That's all? Oh, thanks. I I'll give it to him right away. Brad, that was Mr. Frost. Oh? Uh -huh. He told me to tell you that the records in Sacramento show no Martha L. E. C. H. marriage on file in the last five years. Oh, that's a funny thing to phone about, wasn't it? He said it might be important. Is it? Oh, it's just routine, honey. Little research. For the column? Yeah. Uh, you mind if I go out for a while? Then it is important. Well, in a way, uh, yes. Just mm -hmm. give me my baby. Take care of her, Jimmy. He will. But if you're going to be late... Oh, don't worry, honey. I'll, I'll phone if I am. <laughs> Remember me? What do you want now? Play off me, will you? You're a hard girl to find, Arlene. Not if you know the right bars. You didn't come clean the other day, did you? I gave you the ring and told you all I knew, so what do you want? Well, I've had some records checked in Sacramento. Marriage licenses. They've got nothing on file that checks with that wedding ring, Martha L. and ECH. Nothing in the last five years. Are you alone here? That's right. Well, I've been to the police and the coroner's office, too. Don't worry, I haven't mentioned you. Not yet. This is a photograph of Martha I got from the coroner. They also took fingerprints. But they didn't match anything in the files. I suppose you know she cut all the labels out of her clothes. So what? All except one, Arlene. A label in a glove. The Bonton Shop, Truckee, California. But nobody in the shop remembered her. No? That's tough. How often did she mention Truckee? Never. So what about Nevada? If she was in Truckee, the chances are she was in Nevada, too. Why don't you stop? I told you she didn't talk. Look. I don't want to find out anything bad about her. I'm trying to find my best to, to find something good. Now, what happened to the money? What money? She must have had some money, but they couldn't find even a purse. Okay. She had ten bucks. She wanted me to send it to a landlady she owed. But you kept it. Well, why not? I'd stuck my neck out for her. I had it coming. What landlady? You got the address? I tore it up. This is Madison in Bakersfield. That's all I remember. Mrs. 
Madison, Bakersfield. Thanks for the help. Good morning. Why the owlish look? You, fixing your own breakfast. What's wrong? Well, it's just in kind of a hurry. Now, go on. Beat it. You've got a baby to worry about. He's still sleeping. Now, what's the rush? Well, I... I, uh, have to go up to Bakersfield. More routine? More out-of-town research? Well, I have to fill the column with something. It's not the column, Brad, is it? Oh, Midge, for heaven's sake. It's Jimmy. It's something about Jimmy. What makes you so sure? It stood out all over you ever since we got him. You've been worried, Brad. You know you have. All right. All right. I've been worried. But I'm only trying to find out what most people know about the babies they adopt. What I've done has been for you, Midge, and for Jimmy, too, as well as myself. But why, Brad? You're still thinking how badly the Kincaid boy turned out. Of course not. But can't you see that if, if you feel one way about Jimmy and, and I feel another, then Jimmy's not part of us. He's between us. There's nothing between us. Nothing. Nothing ever can be. Certainly not a little baby. Little? No. He's not little, Brad. He's as big as anything in life. If I felt I had to give him up for you, or if you felt that you must keep him for me, what then? I know you believe you've been thinking of me, but... And I have. I've got to know you have the baby you deserve, and in your heart you must want to know it, too. Midge, why haven't you asked me what I've found out? Because it doesn't matter. Well, I don't know much. Not yet. His mother's dead, and she wanted to die. Brad. Just let me find out why, and all three of us will be happy. That's why I want to go to Bakersfield. Then go, darling. Go and find out. I'm not afraid. And neither is Jimmy. We'll bring you Act Three of Close to My Heart in a few moments. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. After living a life of a moderately successful farmer, Otto Hunderwaddle, with his wife, accepted a job as agricultural advisor to the government of Burma. At first, the Burmese weren't too anxious to work with the Americans, and Otto finally discovered why. They considered him and his wife too old for work. But the Hunter Waddles proved that age had nothing to do with the ability to work. And then the men accepted his help with their drainage and agricultural problems. And Mrs. Hunter Waddle showed the skeptical women how to can food. She was so successful that eventually she and Otto got permission from the Burmese government to build a local cannery. Well, shortly after it was built, however, misfortune struck. Civil war broke out, and the Hunter Waddles and their helpers were forced to abandon their homes. By the time they returned, the cannery was a shambles. But they weren't discouraged. While Otto remained in Burma to help the villagers rebuild their homes, Mrs. Hunderwaddle returned to the United States to raise money for a new cannery. By the time she returned to Burma, she had secured more than enough money and equipment. When last heard from, she and Otto were still helping the Burmese farmers and working in the cannery. For they learned that by helping others, you help your country. now for station identification. The curtain rises on Act Three of Close to My Heart, starring Ray Milland as Brad and Phyllis Thaxter as Midge, with Jeanette Nolan as Mrs. Morrow. It's been two days since Brad went to Bakersfield. He's uncovered no new facts, only clues. But the clues are promising enough to keep him on the trail. Meanwhile, at home, Midge has a visitor, Mrs. Morrow from the adoption agency. Well, you're doing beautifully with Jimmy, Mrs. Sheridan. <laughs> There's a really happy baby. Now, how is Mr. Sheridan? Oh, he's fine, Mrs. Morrow, except he's out of town. Newspaper business, I suppose. Or to learn something about Jimmy. Whatever made you say that? 
Well, in my work, we come to know judges and policemen and even coroners. They told me some time ago that he was trying to track down Jimmy's parentage. Don't let him do it, Mrs. Sheridan. Oh, how can I stop him? It's an obsession with him now, Mrs. Morrow. And, and isn't it better for him to know? Then we can all settle down. Better? You see, you're assuming that what he finds out will be reassuring. What if it isn't? Then if Brad and I love each other enough, we'll, we'll work it out some way. Tell me, honestly. If your husband turns up with something bad about Jimmy, could he love and cherish him as you do? I... I don't know. Well, you're honest. I knew you would be. Now I'll tell you why I really came here. The preliminary adoption papers are ready. Mr. Sheridan has to sign them. But I'm afraid to turn them over to him until he gives up this search. Until we're sure of how he feels. What are you trying to say? That we want Jimmy in a home. Not in a house divided. Remember that, Midge. And let me know as soon as your husband gets back. Hello? This is Western Union. We have a telegram from Mrs. Sheridan from Bannister, California. This is Mrs. Sheridan. Will you read it, please? Jimmy's mother was Martha Lawrence, a school teacher here. Fine reputation, but left suddenly without explanation. Staying on to investigate. Miss you. Love, sign Brad. Thank you. You see, darling, a school teacher. Oh, I knew you were smart. And he meant to say that he missed you, too. He just forgot. Oh, but why does he have to try to find out anything more? It's enough, Jimmy. It's enough. a car and drove out here to your farm, Mr. Williams. I heard in town that you were related to Martha Lawrence. I I better shut off the tractor. No, we really weren't kin to Martha, but she lived with us, Mr. Sheridan. Called us aunt and uncle. She had no relatives at all? No close ones, anyway. We tried to make up for it. Mm -hmm. Then, after she started teaching in town, she used to come out just on weekends. Did she have many men friends? We never really knew. The only man I remember her mentioning was somebody she met in the library. You know his name? No, I never even saw him. Then the initials on the wedding ring, the E-C-H. I just don't know. too difficult, Mr. Sheridan. That's one advantage of a small-town hotel. When you want to check on somebody, you don't have so many names to go through. Now, what date did you say again? Early April, huh? Well, as near as I can figure. Uh, yeah, yeah, I thought so. Here you are, right on the register. Edward C. Hewitt. E-C-H. Was he here long? Uh, well, over a month. Left here on the 4th of April. Said he'd come to buy a farm. Couldn't find anything to suit him, though. Oh, he's not your man, Mr. Sheridan. Why not? Well, of course, he wasn't the type to run off with women. Awful quiet fellow, real shy. Sat around reading all the time. How'd he leave? By train? Yeah, train. Where to now, Mr. Sheridan? Check with the station agent. You're wasting your time. If you had ran off with anything, it was a book. Well, that's quite a story, Brad. So you tracked the girl and Edward Hewitt clear to Reno, huh? Now, what about that picture of Martha and Hewitt that I sent you from Reno? Oh, excuse me, Foster. I better call Midge. She doesn't even know I'm back yet. What about the picture? I checked it against her photo files. No luck. How'd you get it, Brad? Well, you know those street photographers that hang around in front of courthouses? Yeah? Well, on a hunch, I showed them Martha's picture, the one I got from the coroner. And he remembered it. Coincidence? No, not entirely. It seems he'd taken a picture, too. Martha and Hewitt, right after they'd been married. Only there was a mix-up, he said. They huh. paid for it and told him to deliver it to the hotel, but when he did, they'd gone, checked out. Anyway, he still had the print, so he, uh... Hello? Well, I'm back, honey. Oh, Brad! Why didn't you let us meet you? Where are you? At the office. You couldn't have met me anyway. You know what time the plane landed? Right at Jimmy's bottle time. I didn't want to make you choose between us. How much longer 
you be, darling. Well, I'm leaving now, and I've got good news. And look, keep him up, will you? I want to see him. I will, darling. Just hurry. Right. You sound pretty cheerful, knowing so little about this Hewitt guy. Well, she was respectable. Why shouldn't he be? What about this photo from Reno? We could run it tomorrow. Good human interest, and, well, somebody should recognize him. Well, I... I just don't know, Frosty. I, I sort of quit worrying about him. Still, I hate to pass up any bets. Okay, go ahead and run it. But just don't mention Jimmy. Right. Brad, you'll be terribly late, dear. It's almost nine. I've been on time all my life. I'm entitled to be late one morning. Oh, eggs, huh? Mm-hmm. How do they look? Perfect. Everything you do is perfect. And you raise perfect children, too, Mrs. Sheridan. Mm-hmm. Brad, I really think Jimmy knew you were away. Every night when I was giving him his bottle, he kept looking at the door just as if he expected you to walk in. Well, don't think he wasn't on my mind. All the time I was playing detective, I was scared to death I'd find out something bad. I don't know what I'd have done if I had. Well, let's see what the front page looks like. Here it is, Midge picture I was telling you about last night. Who is this man? Go ahead. Read the rest of it. Hmm. His name is believed to be Edward Hewitt. You see him here with his bride a few minutes after their marriage in Reno last year. A typical young couple, happy and with their future before him. But a tragic future. How tragic, Edward Hewitt may not yet know. This newspaper is trying to... Brad... But you've given yourself every chance to find out, haven't you? You told me you were all through even thinking about it. There's no harm in this, honey. It doesn't say a word about Jimmy. But it says a lot about you, doesn't it? It says you're still worried about the father. But I'm not, Midge. I promise you I'm not. Look, those papers Mrs. Morrow left for me to sign, I'll take them to her just as soon as I've checked into the office. Will you, Brad? Oh, now look, honey. Would I sign them if I gave a rap about Jimmy's father? Would I? Oh, now, Midge, you've got to believe me. I want to believe you, Brad, more than you'll ever know. Well, what about the picture, Brad? What's wrong with it? Kill it in the next edition, will you, Frosty? My wife's going crazy. Well, it's too late. A guy thinks he recognized Hewitt. If he's right, you'll know where Hewitt is. Of course, maybe he's wrong, too. Sure he's wrong. But in two hours flying time, you could find out. Who is he? The one in my office. Got it all on my desk. Oh, I'm so glad you dropped by, Mrs. Morrow, but you certainly have a knack of visiting when Brad isn't home. Do you know where he is, Midge? Why, is that the newspaper office? No, he's not. I just came from there. You see, I didn't like that picture in the morning paper. How did you know it was about Jimmy? I recognize the mother's face. I've had a coroner's photograph, too. Oh, Mrs. Morrow, you, you've got to understand. It's just the newspaper man, and Brad, that's all. Your husband has gone to San Francisco to try to identify Jimmy's father. A man in San Quentin prison. Prison? But, but it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't make any difference. It can't. Midge, we both know how he must feel with Jimmy's father a convict. Well, all convicts aren't bad clear through and... Besides, he, he might not be the right man. The point is, your husband wants to be sure. Don't you see? If he thought of Jimmy as his own, if he were capable of that, he wouldn't care. With the example of the Kincaid boy staring us in the face, don't you know that I have to take Jimmy back? You can't. He's mine, Mrs. Morrow. I have to, oh, Midge. But, but the adoption papers. Don't try to fight this. I know how the court will rule. It, it's not that. Don't you see if, if Brad signed the papers, and I know he did, it proves that he really wanted Jimmy in spite of everything. Oh, Mrs. Morrow, please. Wouldn't that make a difference to you? I, I'll call the office. Mr. Frost, he'll know if Brad signed them. Yes, your husband left the papers with Mr. Frost. Unsigned. Unsigned. You've been right all along, Mrs. Morrow. I suppose I always knew you were right. He didn't deserve Jimmy. Don't blame him too much. Under different circumstances, he'll make a wonderful father. Someday, I'll get you another baby. Another baby? Oh, no, dear God, no.
What's it all about, Mac? The guard says I got a visitor from a newspaper. That's right. I came to talk to you about your son. Me? Your son? Who are you kidding? The warden told me your name is Helner. So it's Helner. Didn't you hide out in Bannister using the name of Edward C. Hewitt? Maybe. Maybe not. Now, what's this about a kid? Didn't you marry a girl named Martha Lawrence in Reno? What's she after? Nothing. She's dead. Dead, huh? She died giving birth to your son. <laughs> Leave it to Martha. She reads somewhere that the wages of sin are death, so that's for her. <laughs> for me, too, huh, Mac? The records say you killed a guard in a prison break just before you met Martha. Then you shot a cop before you were finally recaptured. Something like that, yeah. Go ask the warden. But it doesn't make sense. The people in Bannister said they all liked you. I was hiding out. When you're hiding out, you don't go around making people sore. But it couldn't all have been an act. There must have been something about you to appeal to a girl like Martha. Appeal? Sure, books. That's how I met her in the library. I like books. They're great time killers in stir. Besides, I really went for Martha. But the minute she hears I'm on the lamp, she runs out. I never even knew about any baby. Would it have made any difference if you had? Yeah, plenty. There's no place in my business for kids, Mac. Thanks, Selma. I guess that's all. Hey, where do you fit in all this? Well, my wife and I, we, uh... Jimmy lives with us. Jimmy, huh? Hey, how come she didn't name him after me? <laughs> Midge? Anyone home? I'm in here. Oh, what's the matter, honey? Why are you sitting there in the dark? Well, did you find his father, Brad? Then you know where I've been. Well, that makes it easier. Does it? What was he like? Oh, not so bad. Just a guy. You're lying. I know who he is, too. His name is Helner, a murderer in the death house. That's right, Midge. As brutal and callous as something out of the Stone Age. A monster to breed monsters? How'd you find out about all this? Does that matter? Where are you going? To see Jimmy? Well, Jimmy's gone. They took him back, and I'm thankful. Thankful for his sake. They can't take him back. Tell that to Mrs. Morrow. You mean now that they know the truth, they don't consider him eligible for adoption? Protecting you from Jimmy? No, Brad. They're protecting Jimmy from you. But you've got to have Jimmy. We'll get him back if you have to go through every court in the country. Will we? Brad, I know you think you love me. And I know you try to put up with anything to keep me happy. But I won't let you do it. Not at the expense of that poor baby. Where have they got him? At that boarding house? Brad, you can't do it. Can't I? Just let him try and stop me. <laughs> What are you doing here, Mr. Sheridan? If you want to see me, I'll be at my office in the morning. I had to see you tonight, Mrs. Morrow. I've just been to the boarding home. Mrs. Barker. Yes, I know. That's why the probation officer happened to be there, too. Your wife phoned me, Mr. Sheridan. That was a very foolish thing you tried to do, to take the child by force. Mr. Sheridan, I know your wife didn't send you here. Can't you try to be half as courageous as she is? She thinks she's being courageous for Jimmy's sake, but she's wrong. Both of you think I'd ruin him, that I'd be watching and waiting for the poison in him to show up, that I'd never really love him or, or trust him. But you're wrong. I swear to you, you're wrong. Are we so wrong, Mr. Sheridan? I know now there isn't any poison. When I saw Helena today, I knew something not even... He wasn't even human. If he was only half bad, I might have believed he could be Jimmy's father. I might have stayed frightened, frightened of heredity, of bad blood, but... But he was all bad. If you're trying to tell me that Helner isn't the real father... Oh, Helner's the real father, all right, physically. But that isn't what I mean. I talked to the prison doctor. He told me that Helner couldn't transmit to Jimmy any characteristics he didn't have when he was a baby himself. And what does that prove? Well, Helner wasn't born a criminal. Nobody is. What I'm trying to say is that there were two Helners. The Helner I met in the death house and the one I never saw. The one that could have become anything if he hadn't been born in a slum. If he hadn't had to go out and fight the world before he was old enough to know how. You see, I know about that other Helena. I'm not so sure I understand you, Mr. Sheridan. Well, I met Helena's brother today. The prison doctor introduced us. There were five children in that family, and only one went bad. Why? Because he was the one with the ambition to get out of that slum, and there was no one there to tell him how. Nobody except sneak thieves and gangsters, and so he died. 
inch by inch, prison sentence by prison sentence. Mrs. Morrow, Jimmy's father isn't that murderer in San Quentin. His, his real father died years ago, as Jimmy might die, without the love and understanding Midge could give him, and I could give him now. Sit down, Mr. Sheridan. I... I have to make a telephone call. Look at Jimmy. He sees the other baby over there. Come on, let's wheel him over. <laughs> Relax, Hector. Jimmy can lick him if he has to. Oh, be quiet. Why, another baby. How cute. How old is he? Seven, Seven months, months or one, one week. week. Ours is ten months. Hmm. How much does yours weigh? Twenty-four pounds, three ounces. He gained four pounds last week. Oh, uh, what's it ounces, honey? Ours weighs twenty-six pounds. Hmm. How much does he weigh at birth? Well, we don't exactly know. You don't know? How many teeth? What teeth? Well, you must know how many teeth he has. Four. Six. <laughs> this one's got eight. Come along, dear. <laughs> We'd better start walking home. Yeah. Well, I guess Junior showed that kid a thing or two. Isn't it wonderful, Brad? They think we're really parents. It's like being taken into a club. Yeah, the liar's club. <laughs> that baby of his never saw the day it had eight teeth. Hmm. You're beginning to make sounds just like a father. Hey, wait a minute. There's another baby carriage over there. I'll be right back. Hey, how many teeth has your baby got? <laughs> In a moment, our stars will return. At the time when the city of Berlin was blockaded and American Air Force planes were making regular airlifts into the city, Lieutenant Gail Halverson got an extra special idea. He tied his handkerchief to some candy and chewing gum and dropped the uh, candy chute from his plane. Well, this was the beginning of Operation Little Vittles. And soon, from the aircraft of Lieutenant Halverson and his buddies, Thousands of candy shoots dropped every day to the German children around Tempelhof Air Force Base. Americans at home heard of the project and sent handkerchiefs to make the tiny parachutes. To the desperate, blockaded city, it was a symbol of kindness, of generosity, and of hope for the future. Such acts, by you and your friends today, are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are for a special curtain call. Ray Moland and Phyllis Thaxter. <laughs> well, next week, we've chosen the exciting, suspenseful picture from the studios of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. It's the engrossing story of a criminal lawyer who has lost faith in himself until called upon to defend a young client accused of murder in People Against O'Hara. And as our stars... One of your all-time favorites, Walter Pigeon, co-starring with that charming actress, Janet Lee. Well, we'll be listening, Irving. Good night. Good, Good night. by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.